Hello there. How's it going? This is Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome and thank you for listening. How was your week, everybody? How are you doing? Me, I'm okay. I I had a week of sorts. Actually, this week, I came up against the limitations of a yoga teacher profession. And I want to talk about it with you. It's very taboo. I'm really hesitant, actually. I'm uncomfortable right now in this moment as I hope to begin to start to get this out of my mouth for you. But the fact that I'm so uncomfortable about it is why I want to do it. Because I just know that there's going to be a bunch of you listening who this is going to speak to. Because yoga teachers as a profession, we still largely exist in the margins. On this podcast, I've often talked about with guests and in these intros about how yoga has become mainstream. And in a commercial sense, from like a marketing demographic standpoint, that is true. You know, People using yoga to sell shit, that's totally mainstream. But the profession still, as I said, largely exists in the margins in particular when it comes to our tax codes. And we're getting to that time, right? It's right around tax time. And this is an area where yoga teachers, we just we don't talk about this stuff ever. And most of us get all of our pay on 1099s. Like in my entire adult life, I have never, ever received a W-2. It's never happened for me. I know there are some yoga centers out there who do that now, but I have never had that. And I certainly know a lot of other yoga teachers who've never had that. We're 1099. And so what that means is when it comes time to do our Schedule Cs and our tax returns, we, to a certain degree, have to decide how much of the cash business that we're going to report. Because yoga teachers do a lot of cash business. And at first, I used to have a lot of dilemma about this. Like, I don't want to be, I want to be an honest person. Quite frankly, my dad was very creative with his taxes over the years. And I just, I'm not that, I get too uncomfortable. I don't, I'm not comfortable with trying to swindle anyone or get away with anything necessarily. So I want to be honest. But at the same time, I don't want to be stupid. And the reality of it is, if you don't pay quarterly, which I never do, I know you're supposed to, but I never do, at the end of the year when it comes time to file your taxes, you're going to, ha- you're going to have a, a big old check you got to write. And if you haven't planned for that or... The way yoga teachers' monies go is very unpredictable. If that's not there, then you could be screwed. So a lot of times the choice to not report all of the cash business is at a survival. You know, just you have to try to find a way to live at that tax burden. And if we're talking about morals, well, I've, I guess there's a certain relativity sometimes in my mind about that when I think about you know, corporations that don't pay any taxes at all. And that doesn't justify my own personal behavior. But in any case, all this is to say that, you know, keeping my income down on my tax returns, one, makes less of a tax burden. And I would say more importantly, over the last couple of years has really been what's enabled me to afford health insurance, puts me in a, a bracket where I can actually afford it more. So the reason I'm telling you all this is this week I tried to get a mortgage because we live in this apartment here in Brooklyn. It's gotten too expensive. We need to move. And I'm just thinking about moving into another rental apartment and thinking that is stupid, that I can go like an hour and a half from here and have the same monthly payment that's one-third what I'm paying now and own it. So why am I not doing that, right? So 
in any case, I went through the whole process that you got to go to of educating yourself and putting in calculators and trying to figure out what I might qualify for. And so in any case, I'm not sure that I'm going to qualify because my net income is not necessarily going to meet the DTI, the debt to income ratio needed. I'm close. I'm right there on the mark. I don't know, you know. But in order for me to get approved, it's going to require someone to really like look at my application and maybe read a little bit between the lines and be caring enough to give me a chance, basically. Because if it's just the raw numbers, I don't think I'm very impressive. But, you know, I checked my credit score yesterday and I have a 798 credit score. That's pretty freaking good. It's not like I'm like a degenerate. I got, the center's been running for nine plus years. I never missed a payment, you know? But if it's going to just be an algorithm, if it's just a computer, if it's just the numbers, I might not get it. I put it in, uh, it's an FHA through a credit union, which is really like the most lenient (laughs) uh, hoops you got to get through. Um, so I put that application in today and I'm going to find out in the next couple days and I'm going to be honest, if we don't get approved for that loan, I'm going to feel like a failure. I don't, I don't think that I'm a failure, but if we don't get approved for that, I, I'm going to feel that way. I know it. So Crap, I'm sorry. I don't mean to dump all this on you guys, but I know there's a lot of yoga teachers out there and, you know, decisions you make, <laughs> they can come home to roost later. I mean, it'll be fine if we don't get approved. Our only other option is to get a co-signer, which I don't even know. We haven't discussed that. And I hate that someone else is going to be responsible for me. Ah. It'll be fine. Even if we don't get approved and we don't get a loan, then we can rent in that same area and it's still going to be way more affordable and it'll still be a good move even if we don't get to own. But gosh darn it, you know, what are you going to do? See, this is yoga teacher uh, dark sides. (laughs) I don't know if that's accurate, but... For whatever it's worth, you guys, something to consider. If you want to get a mortgage someday, you probably want to report more of that and figure out a way to pay the taxes on it or something. Wish me luck, everybody. Wish me luck. Actually, this is not a bad intro to today's talk. Today... Alex O'Dare is here. And if there's anybody who I think could appreciate my situation and the challenges of being an independent yoga teacher and yoga center owner, it would be Alex. She has done the same thing that I'm doing and dealt with the same kind of stuff I'm dealing with. We go way back and she was around. She's a, a... early New York yoga scene person, but she's also somebody who was sort of forging this independent yoga center model early on, and she continues to do that today in Philadelphia. She moved. She already made the move three years ago. So in any case, we talk about, oh gosh, a lot of stuff. This was recorded on Inauguration Day. If you remember recently, I I shared my talk with Thea Wildcroft, that was the other one that was recorded on that day. This was later that afternoon. I had this talk with Alex. So we we do touch a little bit on politics. She's somebody who's outspoken. So at the end, I let her have an opportunity to say some things that she might want to say. Fair warning. And also just fair warning that one of the things I love most about Alex is that She's always been a a bit of a provocateur. She's always kind of getting people riled up in certain ways just because of the the way that she is. She's 
um, sort of body and irreverent. She likes to cuss a lot, which I just, I don't know. I, I don't know if listeners find it distasteful and I kind of caught myself cussing last week and maybe thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. But I personally, in certain ways, it makes me comfortable when someone cusses. I don't know. I, I kind of, there's a certain rock and roll, punk rock part of me that just feels very at home with Alex. So it was great talking to her, and I think it'll be fun for you guys to be in on it today. Before we do, let me plug my stuff. I've got dates And it would be very cool for me to meet you in person, especially if you enjoy listening to this podcast, getting to see you face to face and have an actual practice is just super fun. So if you're around and you want to come hang out, I am going to be in Japan, March 18th through the 26th. I'm going to be in West Hartford, Connecticut at West Hartford Yoga, April 30th. I'm going to be at the Feathered Pipe Ranch in Montana, June 17th through the 24th. You can find out more about those events. You can listen to the archives of this podcast and read the archives of my blog and find my online yoga video offerings at jbrownyoga.com. If you're digging the podcast, maybe you would show me a little bit of love and go to iTunes write a review and give us some stars. Maybe you would go to a blog or podcast page and make a donation. Even if I get approved for that freaking loan, I'm going to need every dollar I can get. No, I don't really mean that. I don't really mean that. Really, I'm just super psyched that you're listening. And thank you to everybody who takes the time to send me an email or writes a comment and expresses support or even not even those of you who sometimes like question me about things or whatever sometimes people have challenges and i appreciate that too any anybody interacting listening giving a darn about this podcast thank you from the bottom of my heart i really do appreciate it okay let's get to our talk today with my dear and old friend, Alex O'Dare. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so, you know, it, we started <laughs> talking because <laughs> I didn't even think about it before we scheduled. Nor did I. Uh, and I actually did another one this morning, and I had, like, a bunch of stuff to do. And on bo- like, last night, for a quick second, I did realize, and I thought, should I reschedule? And then I said, no, screw that. I'm doing everything I want to do today. Good. I'm totally glad because I'm also, I'm in a good mood, like, but like a crazy mood. Like I kind of want to reap and pillage, you know, but uh, like yeah. after the uh, general election, I was, you know, sobbing the next morning and we had class and everyone was like sobbing on the floor. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had class at Mago Yoga at my place, but now for some reason today, I feel like just almost like energized, but like yeah, I just want to like loot and pillage. I think I might turn to like anarchy and nihilism. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to fill my time with like things yeah. that like I can like enjoy and feel are fruitful and like good for the earth <laughs> you're, you're, and you've not spend my them. time like too much of my time tuning into the other thing that's happening, which doesn't seem to be about that. You've always been more positive than I have. Uh, well, you know, that also brings me to the other thing. First of all, I'm sorry okay. it take me so long to get you on the podcast. Oh, God, don't worry about it. I've been no. so enjoying I haven't had a chance to comment on how much I loved hearing Kachi, too. You know, she was my one of my first teachers, and I ran into her at Kripalu over the summer when I was teaching. Mm. We, like, were both at the lake, and she opened her car door, and I was like, oh, my God, Kachi. And it was so amazing. I was on my way out, and she was on her way in. Wow, how about that? Yeah. Well, yes, we run in many same circles and have many same friends. And I taught at your place, Moksha. I know, I know. For like a couple of months, one summer. I don't really even remember what year that was. It was yeah. like a little before you, you let go of it, I know. Totally. And you, because you were in, very instrumental in our wonderful dear friend Noah's life. Oh, that's right. Noah and Lauren, they talked yes. there. And, and they, they got, got married, married there. They got married yes. at your place. And you, know, and you remember who married them? 
Who you married? remember? I don't Anna know. Forrest. Oh, that's right. I do remember that. Yes, yeah, she right. married them at my place. Because um, she was really like Laura and, and, and Noah's mentor for a time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was really starting with Lauren and then Lauren introduced her to Noah. Right, right, right. Wow. So we go pretty far back. And, you know, it's funny because I thought since we do go so far back and we have so many friends, I thought, oh, yeah, I, I know you. But then, like... I have this routine now whenever I'm going to have one of these talks to like do a little research. Yeah. And I did learn some things about you that I didn't totally know, which I thought were kind of interesting given some of your recent work yourself. Yeah, tell me, what did you learn? <laughs> well, you know, I knew that you, your mother was like a celebrity of sorts and I knew that you lived in New York, but I didn't really know anything about her or that she was like a Warhol star. Yeah. yeah. Um, or that you grew up in the Chelsea Hotel yeah. And- I know. It's funny because we, because I left the New York scene, you know, right? Like all of your, all of the teachers that you speak of were also my, te- I mean, that you speak with, many of them were also my teachers. And the whole, as you have pointed out, which is what I love about your podcast, is that it has become this history of how the burgeoning history of yoga in New York City. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it's funny because I right away, I guess something about me that I always do sort of the opposite, you know, left and opened my studio, not in Manhattan, you know? And I mean, and, but, um, so I wasn't really part of the growing culture as it was happening. I was sort of slightly removed from it. So Mm -hmm. we never really spent a lot of time, you and I together, but yet we had these parallel things going on, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess getting back to your mom a little bit, because first of all, like, you grew up in the Chelsea Hotel, so I only know that place from, like, rock star mm-hmm. legend stories. And, like, I read a thing about you, like, roller skating around the hallways mm-hmm. and the drug dealers there. So yes. say something about that seems like a pretty crazy yeah. childhood, very far away from where I grew up. Yes. Well, where did you grow up? I grew up in the suburbs of Los Angeles. Oh, I didn't realize that. Maybe you did yeah. say that once. That's that's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, it's so funny. You know, it's hard. It's, I think it's hard to interview me because I always want to ask questions. So you I'm can ask to... as many questions as you want. <laughs> I don't really think of it as an interview. We're just okay. talking. And we haven't talked for a long time. So I know. I feel know. welcome to ask okay. your questions okay. as well. But I will answer yours. Yes. Yeah, so the Chelsea, it was, I actually wrote a book about growing up in the Chelsea, but it's not published. But um. Mm. I loved it. So, uh, you know, I was practically born in the lobby. Um, my dad is a video artist and he was like sort of one of the early, he's French and he was one of the early, I'm going to say, you know, almost it wouldn't be thought of this then and still isn't now it's thought of as art, but he was like reality TV in a way because he documented our lives, like our everyday lives, you know, with one of like, he, I hit my actual birth is videotaped. I read that. There's like mm-hmm. all these, there's like home indie movies of your mom giving birth to you. Yes. Now, and remind me because that has to do with my very first yoga class. Don't let me forget to tell you that. I won't. Um, um, so, yeah, so my mom was in labor with me on, in the lobby of the Chelsea, and Jerry, the desk man, who, you know, I'm not actually sure if he's still there, but he was just a few years ago. Uh, well, everything's changed there now, so he probably isn't. But um, anyways, he, in the video, he says, my dad's like, is it good to be a boy or a girl? And Jerry's like, I think it's going to be a girl, Michelle. <laughs> and uh, and that, like, that man, Jerry, is who was the desk man my entire, you know, until I went to college. Well, we moved a little bit. We moved around a little bit because my mom and dad got divorced when I was like five and we moved around. But basically, but then we moved back to the Chelsea. And for the few years where we weren't there, I mythologized the Chelsea. My as a very young child, I was like, when are we going to go back to the Chelsea Hotel? I loved it. It was like the most safe. And I know it sounds nutty if you look at it on paper with the hookers, drug dealers, cops were there all the time. Fires. We were on the cover of like page six in the post because of this big fire. Um. We didn't lock our door. Everybody, I could come home at any time of night, you know, like I, I went, I clubbed, you know, I was like, a, yeah. went up to clubs when I was like 13, 14, but totally like just danced and <laughs> maybe had a couple of drinks. I wasn't a druggie or anything, but you know, those were the days, the good old days. Yeah. And I would come home at 3am, like always, hey Alex, you know, I could 
See, but that's what I'm saying. You were 13 and 14, and you were coming home at 3 a.m., yeah, and your parents were like, hey, Alex. I know. I'm probably slightly exaggerating, but no, I think <laughs> I was 13 14, but also it was such a different time. And, you know, in that sort of outlier class, we were a lot more sophisticated, us kids, I have to say, you know, and I was tall, so I did look older. You know what I mean? Yeah, and New York was really like a lot grungier, wasn't it? Oh my God, so wonderful. I ne- like I know that was considered a dangerous era, but maybe I could count three times that I ever feel unsafe on the street. Um, it was totally grungy. We were friends, you know, in those days we called them bums. We were friends with all the bums. I remember when I first got to New York, there was a bum at the, the bank down the street. Yes. And he'd open the door for me, and I became totally friendly with him. And I remember my dad visited me, like, introduced them. My dad was, like, so impressed or whatever. But, like, yeah, that was, like, it was, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, there was this, my best friend was this Hungarian theater group named the Squat Theater who had this entire, they were called the Squat building down the street from us. Actually, it's that big cineplex that's now on 23rd Street between 7th and 8th, but it was this beautiful building that got torn down. And there was this bum who lived in the stairwell next to them and, you know, I had known him since I was a toddler until I went to college. Hmm. Well, that's late exaggeration. He probably got kicked. Giuliani probably kicked him out in the. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I just when I looked up your you and your mom, I, and yeah. it said that she was like on the phone with him when he got shot by that woman yes. I saw in the movie. Yes, my mother was on the phone with him when Valerie Solana shot him. That's- I, that's crazy. And then I know. something about how she was like friends with his mom for a while, but then there was a falling out. Yeah. Well, her time with him, you know, her time with him was really not long. I think 1968 was her first movie. You know, she had a handful of movies. By yeah. the time I was born in 71, they had already fallen out. They were not enemies or anything. Like he would. Once in a while, I'd see him. You know, he took a few Polaroids of us in the Chelsea. But we, she wasn't really part of that scene. And I see. my mom, mom, I'm sure you'll listen to this, and <laughs> I don't think you'll mind if I say this. She, you know, would end up falling out with a lot of people because my mom's extremely outspoken. And you know, Warhol did not pay as you know as wealthy and successful as he became. The people like my mother, who were really just themselves, did not reap any benefits from that. So mm-hmm. unfortunately, my mom had a, that fame, but she had nothing, you know, no financial retribution to show for it. So that became an issue. You know, yes, that is an interesting thing, and that mm-hmm. kind of speaks to things today as well. And yeah. it also speaks. The reason I kind of want to start there a little bit because you you made a point of pointing out the videos that you made. Mm-hmm, which, mm-hmm. which I had seen some before, but I went and made sure to watch all of them again. <laughs> you did but they were part. very like Warhol esque to me. <laughs> it's so funny. I never thought of that, but when you say that, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm, I'm, you're kind of I'm, carrying on some tradition there, or something. Even the, in, in the terms of being outspoken as well, and totally. And, totally. and, and, no, and we I, can we can talk more about that because I know you're outspoken about a lot of things that I am, and I want mm-hmm. us to go there. But I do. I want to go back a little bit. So. Sure. So, you, okay, so you're, like, clubbing at mm-hmm. age of 14 or maybe a little bit older. Maybe you're exaggerating a little bit. You're in New York City. I talked with Eddie Stern. Yes, I love that. He that, that. was hanging around in New York, same like you, going yeah. to CBGBs and stuff. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of, like, where you were, you were, like... Yeah, I was a little... I actually wasn't a CBGBs kid, so I was a little weird. I mean, in the sense that I was not part of that crowd. I hung out because of the squat theater, which would take an entire other podcast to describe, Mm -hmm. which was this really radical, I mean, good to know, like look them up. Sometimes they're, they were incredible radical theater group. I hung out with these older folks. And, um, so the, the, you might know Esther Balance. She was the girl in stranger than paradise. Do you remember that oh, Jim Jarmusch movie? I, that's, that movie was hugely shaping to me. Okay, so Esther, who is a very close friend of mine, continues to be in our children or friends. She, she was in one of your videos. <laughs> yes, exactly. So her family was the Squat Theater. Oh. And so Esther is a little older than me. Sorry, Esther. And, um, <laughs> and she was extremely 
famous in New York at that time. And so we had this inn at the Palladium. Mm. And so the Palladium was our gig. And also Nell's. Do you remember Nell? Oh, I don't um, think I know that was on I do remember the Palladium, though. Yes. Yeah, so we, Howie, the doorman at the Palladium, even though Rebecca, who was my best friend and who was six foot two at the time when we were 13, and I was my height, 5'10", we, I had braces, so Esther would be like, all right, girls, cover up your braces so, you, so Howie lets you in. And uh, we'd cover up our braces, and we would party at the Palladium, like, very often, and then also at Nell's a lot. So, like, dance Eterio once or twice. Really, I have to say CBGBs much, actually, when I was later high school, you know, middle, mm-hmm. later high school a few times. But I, I wish I had been more in that scene. That was probably more fun on some level. But um, Well, I love the way it's such a New York thing that you, like, you know all the names of all the doormen. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It was so funny. How it was a real thing. And he started this, like, cabaret at the Palladium. And a little bit of a offshoot, non sequitur here. But I did this, like, little skits, okay? So it would take too long to describe. My mom was like, oh, my God, they are so amazing. We have to get you in the in the we have to get you to the palladium in that cabaret and she called the palladium so that i could be part of the cabaret scene you know but this is somebody because i am literally i want to say probably 14 and of course and this is how like we lived in our own world my mom actually thought they would let me you know be in the palladium cabaret and and then of course you know they said i was too young (laughs) and she was pissed off (laughs) <laughs> All right. So beyond clubbing it out around yeah. New York City yeah. in the 70s, I guess, right? Well, 80s at that 80, point? At that point, 80s, because 71. So I was pretty, I was too young in the 70s. So early, uh, mid 80s, you know, early right. mid 80s. So when you finish high school, do you go to, mm-hmm. do you go to college at all? What do you do? Yeah. What, what? So, uh, when, so in high school, I went first to LaGuardia, which was music and art and performing arts had just been put together and they called it LaGuardia, had just been merged, you know, the fame school, the school from fame. And my drama teacher was actually the drama teacher in the movie fame. No way. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moody, yep. Come on. Yes, God. You had the actual guy from the show? Yeah. Yep. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy because I watched that show. I was like a performer kid well, too. Well, not so not well, I don't know if he was on the TV show but the movie version, you know. Okay, okay. Okay, so so check out the movie version, which is the better version, but I did watch the show too. <laughs> All right, so you're in art high school. Yes, and so I was an actress, mm. like like professional, you know, I did some movies and LaGuardia doesn't let you work professionally. So when oh. I got my first Okay, well, I had already done a movie with my mom, a Vim Vendors movie, when I was 10, called The State of Things. Mm-hmm. And then when I got my first, like, Hollywood gig, I was at LaGuardia, and Mr. Escaro, the principal, said, you know, we, I had to choose whether to do the movie or to stay in LaGuardia. Uh. And actually, in retrospect, I totally respect him, and I should have stayed at LaGuardia, to be yeah. honest, because they were correct. Like, they wanted you to go to conservatory and really t- hone in your skill, which... Right is better but at the time i did not choose that i did the movie hiding out starring john crier and um then i switched over to pcs professional children's school which is a little private school near there for kids who are like professional ballet dancers violinists actors and actually i had a really lovely experience there it's much smaller and that's really when i got tuned into literature writing and academics in a more serious way funnily enough and that's what led me to bard college where i went to college but i had already started yoga before i went to bard college i see so that specialized school was at like one-to-one learning did you go to like a place for that or like how does Uh, that work yeah it was a real school like totally classes all that you know regular teachers was just smaller because it was private and it was this weird group of like you know there was like some you know, kids, the actors we would know now, like Martha Plimpton and Jerry Mc- McConnell. I don't know if I forgot his name. He's married to Rebecca Romaine Stamos. I just forgot what his name is all of a sudden. And, uh, and uh, you know, there was some, like, people who later achieved fame. And, but you, you still went to classes. So I just went to school like you would every day. But if you had an audition, for, for example, you just bring a note in and be like, I have to leave it too for my audition. And then you just come back to school. I mean, oftentimes we just fuck off and do our own thing and pretend we had an audition. I but, see. Uh, so was it like it was just like a school that 
it kind of understood the special needs of mm-hmm. somebody, a kid who was also like working as an actor some. Exactly. And it was actually really great for professional musicians and dancers because they had such a rigorous, you know, rehearsal schedule. Mm-hmm. So when you would go on set or go on a, you know, on tour, depending on what you were doing, they'd give you your packet of homework and all that. But they actually had really great teachers there. And I had this amazing like socialist history teacher who got me into politics and the and like the history of America and, you know, stuff like that, because it was very, it was more intimate, the classes compared to LaGuardia. There was 3000 students at LaGuardia and I don't know, there was 900. I went to public school and it was like, I mean, I got an okay education, but I yeah. imagine getting like more attention like that and being able to work at your own pace even more, I think would probably be better. Like that's what they're doing, like Finland and stuff, you know? Totally. It was <laughs> much more like that. It's exactly. Yeah. And I, at LaGuardia, it was so hard. Actually, you had five academics period, five periods of your major, you know, of your drama, whatever. And I was like loaded with homework and it was really stressful. And so in some level, then it was a good move to go to PCS. But if I had really wanted to become a series actor, you know, yeah. I see what Mr. Escrow was saying. Yeah. All right. So you <laughs> go to school for uh, this specialized school, but then you said you went to Bard College. Yes. So I went to, uh, I was completely, you know, like I did no preparation for anything, you know, like basically my parent, like SATs were never met. I went to the SATs. I literally just copied the the pattern of the person next to me with those little black dots. You know, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I had no kind of established preparation in that sense. So it's, you know, kind of a boring long story. I did go to NYU for one semester, and then I took a year off. But basically, I ended up at Bard, which was like the only school I applied to at the very last minute. But it was, <clears throat> yeah, very instrumental in my life. A really what, good choice. What What were you doing there? Were you studying something in particular <laughs> there? Uh, so were you doing more theater stuff, or no? I actually, <clears throat> because of um, PCS and the teachers that I loved at PCS, I ended up being a writer and interested in literature. So I was, I was a literature and writing major at Bard and that's where I met my husband, my current husband, my only husband that I've ever had. <laughs> mm. We met at Bard and that's where I opened my first yoga studio and okay, that's so, where I taught yoga. Yeah. All right. So when, when did you, you said earlier, remind uh-huh. me about my first yoga class and the birth video. Oh, yes. Good, good. So when was your first yoga class? And what does that have to do with the video that your mom made of giving birth to you in the Chelsea Hotel? Good. You're, you're, you're good, Jason. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes. So a friend of mine, Lynn Appel, I've mentioned her before. Like I wrote a little thing about kind of my first yoga experience. But um, uh, she, I, so I didn't mention this, but I had been a ballet dancer, like at, School of American Ballet, but I, so like maybe my mom took me to audition there. I want to say I was like eight and I stayed there for years. I hated it. And I ended up telling my teacher to fuck off in front of the entire class. And it was really thrilling. I still get excited about it sometimes. <laughs> wow. So wait a second. I want to, I want to, yeah, yeah. I want to take that picture in because, okay. Okay. you know, in my many years of uh, being a yoga teacher, I've certainly met a lot of dancers and mm-hmm. I dated a lot of dancers even before uh-huh. I was a yoga teacher. And I remember there was a brief time where I studied like postmodern dance stuff, like like contact improv and like theater mm-hmm. stuff. And then I took a ballet class. Yeah. And I actually remember being upset, like emo- like because I couldn't uh-huh. do what they were asking me to do in the way that they were speaking to me. Like it felt like a little bit emotionally traumatizing. <laughs> Yes. And then the idea to this, I can imagine somebody in that situation, a young girl, like, and what you would have to do to like tell her to fuck off. That would be a thing. That would be a real thing. I know. And I'm actually, I'm really like proud of myself that I did that. And I can't believe I did. I was really scared by the way. I was like quivering and I sobbed afterwards, but Yeah. yeah, like that was those I was basically extremely flexible genetically, hypermobile. And, you know, when they audition you, they, like, poke your your feet out to turn out and, like, stick your leg up behind your head. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you know, have you seen those little videos? Like, it's like that. Like, the Russian person comes over and takes your leg and, like, shoves it up as high as it'll go, you know? Yeah. So I – but I had no strength, which, you know, will eventually bring us to where we are now, where I have 
a torn hip labrum and, um, and um, no really coordination. So anytime it was time for us to do choreography across the floor, the teacher would just look down, you know, and so it would be like split up into the shitty girls and the really talented girls. And I was in the shitty girl group mm. and uh, who they hated. And basically one day I was just furious and I went and grabbed my bag under the bars and I walked across the room, like in the middle of when the good girls were going across the room. And the teacher was like, where are you going, young lady? And I said, my mom pays for classes here. And if you're not going to correct me, then there's no point in me staying in class. And she was like practically spitting. And she was like, if you walk out that door, don't ever come back. And I went, I just opened the door, looked at her and went, fuck you and slam the door. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You see, and it seems like you've been doing that ever since a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> sort of. I wish I had said fuck you to the first yoga teacher who tried to get me to hold my ankles and back bend before I even knew what core strength was. But. Yeah, but you see, nobody knew any better back then. I know, I know. All right, so let's get to okay. that. So that sets up something. We're still getting to your first yeah. yoga class. Yes. Okay, so then, so I was, you know, I was a physical person, and I think I always did party tricks, like stuck my leg behind my head and stuff. So my friend, <laughs> Lynn Pell, an older woman, was like, you've got to come with me to this yoga class. You're going to love it. I don't know how she knew I'd love it, but I did. And she brought me to Jiva Mukti and she brought me to Sharon. And I know this sounds crazy. Sharon will corroborate this. She, she will fall. She, if you want to fact check and Sharon goes, I know you, I've seen you being born. Oh, <laughs> she knew the film. eh? Yes. Yes. And, um, and um. I was surprised, amazed and, uh, that she had even seen that, you know, it was pretty cool that she was that tuned in. Cause that's pretty, at that time it was like pretty underground avant-garde art world that my dad's videos were in. And so I was just blo- right away blown away by the class. And uh, I don't know, it's hard. I, it's very hard to remember why it spoke to me so much. I, you know. Was that on Second Avenue? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is like, okay, so this is 1989. 89. Yeah, that's the year I graduated high school. It might have actually even been 88. It was like between 88 and 89. And that's when you met them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And uh, Eddie was one of my, Eddie, Ruth, Sharon, and David, first group of teachers. That was before any kind of teacher training, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, Shivananda existed. That's where they had done their teacher training. I think somebody on your podcast recently, I think maybe Kachi mentioned this, like White Lotus was around, I think. Yes, she had gone there. She mentioned them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, Iyengar was always around. Um, Yeah, yeah. So uh, you were were right then when they first were kind of opening that place pretty much. Yeah. Because yeah. Eddie only taught there right at the beginning. Exactly. Uh, he did, I did my first shoulders and everything. It was the first time I ever queefed in yoga. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, lovely. Two to yeah. form. Yes. And it was mm-hmm. with Eddie Stern, no less. What exactly. A- I was very embarrassed. Um, <laughs> nice. And uh, he, he, he had a stoic stone face. I'm sure. I'm sure. He had a very traditional way of handling the moment. Uh, yes, yes. So, you know, Sharon was like, so right up my alley you know she looked edgy and was gorgeous and black eyeliner and played bob dylan who was my favorite and and they were very like in the performance art world too yeah, right? uh, yeah yeah and she was just so lovely to me you know she really just felt you know she was this other mother to me you know and um and when she ch- you know i hadn't i had done i had chanted before so you know you probably already know this and my mom was briefly a Muktananda disciple. So I had been very young introduced to Muktananda. I barely remember. And my mom would chant a lot. We had, we had um, like the, some of the city yoga tapes. So that would be playing in the house. And my mom used to meditate. So I was, you know, I was, had been introduced to the sort of mystical, spiritual side of yoga. I see. And, but when Sharon first, but not like nothing formal class or, or consistent. And when Sharon first started chanting, I just, you know, I was like brought to my knees in, I don't know, just, you were down, you were down, you felt it, you felt it. Yeah, I felt it, yeah. All right. So you become a regular practitioner at Jiva Mukti. Yes. And that was like this, so that's what I call this funny little like, blip because then so I regularly practiced there then I left to go to college and I actually like did not I was very judgmental and like the 
a probably really sweet old man who taught at Bard, I was like, this is not yoga. You know, to me, it had what I thought at the time was like hard, intense, sweaty yoga. I thought everything else was bullshit, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, like gentle yoga, whatever. And, um, <laughs> and nobody knew much about it, you know? So I like basically didn't practice yoga. I did like aerobics at Bard and swam and, um, and, you know, really skipping ahead then. Oh, I see. So that makes sense to me, though, because I remember you from, I mm-hmm. guess, after you must have come back after college. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I came back and was very depressed at the fact that I had no life skills and no job and wasn't <sighs> just a magic wand tapped on my head and was famous and uh, mm. and didn't know what to do with myself. And I lived in a little apartment on Orchard Street with my best friend, Layla. And I just started going out with my husband and he was still a bard. He had another year and a half at bard. And I basically couldn't, it was the only time where I was actually truly depressed in life, like where I couldn't get off the couch. And I was like, Oh, maybe I'll try going to Jiva Mukti. That yoga place. Yeah. I'll go there, you know? Mm. And then it's many years later now. So yeah, this is like 94, Ah, see, that's right when I showed up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. We mm. must have been in class together at the of, same time. I'm sure. I took Hachi's class all the time. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's so wild. Okay, so you go to school, you come back. Mm-hmm. It's 94, mm-hmm. right when I'm there, and you kind of get back into the, the Then scene I get there. really into it. So then I'm like... Because you did the training there, right? Well, no, not exactly. I've never done a training. Never been trained. <laughs> I kind of thought, weren't you, didn't you teach well, there? Yes, yes. I was the rare, oh, no, so I'll tell you. So I, so I would go, you know how Kachi said she would do two classes a day? I would secretly do two classes a day because as you remember, nobody, it wasn't cool to, to be doing yoga at that time. No, I mean, well, nobody knew what it was. No. So I <laughs> it was, was a counterculture sp- thing, definitely. Exactly. So I was like, pretend I had a job interview and would actually be going to a second yoga class. And then I would secretly chant, you know, Krishna Das was leading Kirtan at the time. So I would secretly, you know, go home and play a little tape of Krishna Das in my bedroom with the door closed and like, and like trying to quietly chant because I thought people would think I was crazy, you know, that Layla would think I was crazy. Hmm. But then it really wasn't that long. I was only there doing that for... I ha- you know, it's embarrassing to say, actually, of the little training I had. But I'm going to say I'm going to say a year and a half, maybe two years. And I moved back upstate because. I so, wait, so you just got I mean, it's not at all embarrassing because I did the same thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I did like eventually do this like month long thing with Allison. Mm-hmm. But like m- most people learn to teach yoga by just attending classes yeah. regularly. And yes. you were actually able to get a pretty good yoga education that way at one time i i think so and i and i i did feel you know i went to meditation with sharon i went to all the sad songs you know but then i just really you know nick and i were serious and he had this extra year and i had no money so i basically moved back to upstate new york and would do my own practice oh and i had started ashtanga by the way jiva Muti at that point sharon was yeah. like you should try this thing ashtanga and i was like what's it like and she was like just come and try it yeah they brought it in after patabi made the rounds right exactly and i took the first class and i was like sharon that was amazing it was a lead class sharon led it and she goes and she goes i always remember this. she goes whoa why why would you say it's amazing and i was like well, well. she goes but it's always the same mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, because it was a sequencing thing. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, so she didn't. She couldn't believe I thought that. You know what I mean? It just was what it was, which is so interesting. Her response, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, how so, did you how did you start teaching there then? Because I know at some point they made it like you had to be through the training in order to yeah. teach there, and a lot of people left. Yes. So I. By the way, we yeah. So we had become fairly close, Sharon and I, and I, you know, close. I mean as close as a teacher student can be, but I felt very close to her. And so I did my, so I went back upstate and I started practicing. I had a hard time practicing in my, in our apartment, in our house, because we also shared it with us, like another Bard student. And so I went to the Bard gym and I would practice and people would be like, what are you doing? That's amazing. And I'd be like, oh, it's this thing, Ashtanga. I was like, do it, come and do it with me. Mm -hmm. So like a couple friends of mine, like my sister is 11 years younger than me and she also went to Bard. Um, and 
so well this that would be later I guess but anyways there was like some younger kids I was friends with I call them kids I was a kid too but you know what I mean a little younger than me and people would come and and uh and I would just be like, do it alongside me. And then, of course, I would be like, here's how you do this pose, you know. And so I wasn't formally teaching. I didn't even think of myself as a teacher. And then someone was like, you should teach this at the gym. And I thought about it. All right, I'll ask the gym manager. And the gym manager was like, sure, we we'll take this day. So I started teaching this class yeah. <laughs> at the bar gym. And, you know, it got popular. And, oh, and it was like a, actually a big age range, like a barred professors would come and people from the community and then my husband Nick was like look why don't we just rent this space it's it'll be easier it's so cheap down the street and t- near Tivoli and then you can just lead classes here and I can quickly paint it and build it out you know we didn't even use the words build out at that time he was like mm-hmm. I'll make some dressing rooms and, da, da, da. and he's very skilled at that kind of thing and I was like oh, okay yeah let's do it so basically we like rented out the space and it became Hudson Valley Yoga otherwise known as Moksha and um, that and was I first. Mean, I mean, sorry to interject, but I, yeah. uh, having taught at, at one iteration, I don't know if that was the same one because I taught in Rhinebeck, but it, I remember that um, it was pretty lean operations. Like you were oh, back yeah. in the day where it was like you, you basically, there was like a change box at the door and like yes, a sign in sheet, you, you know? I do it the exact same way to this day, <laughs> except I do use mind body, but there's a cigar box with cash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's no lobby. It's, it literally looks like it's actually a smaller version of my of Hudson Valley Yoga. You know. <laughs> yes. um, All right. So you you yeah. you you start teaching like a lot of us did. I was the same. Where you just mm-hmm. went to a lot of classes and then you started doing what you were doing with other people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It gets popular in a place where there probably wasn't a lot of yoga classes yet. No, nothing. I was the first. There was one studio in Kingston, and I was the only yoga studio in that part of the Hudson Valley. All right. So then you rent a space in Tivoli, you said, which I know the area. Yes. And you open up Hudson 19. Valley Yoga off 19. And then you – so you, so do you start – you're the only one teaching. I'm the only one teaching. Actually, okay, so here's what I did. I called Sharon, and I said, will you come – I, I also cannot believe I did this uh, just because I was so nervous. I said, will you come and take my class and basically give me your blessing and tell me if you agree with what I'm teaching? So she and David came to Hudson Valley Yoga in Tivoli, took my class. It was like them, Sharon and David, and maybe like, oh, I invited people because I was so nervous there'd be nobody. So there was probably like four other people. Mm-hmm. Then they slept over. Then we made them dinner at my at our place, and they slept over, <laughs> and left the next day. And and uh, you know, she was yeah. I mean, I don't want. I feel like it's like a, oddly one of the weird things I feel shy talking about, just because it's was so like tender to me. Yeah, but she basically was like, "You totally got what we were teaching," and. It's beautiful, and yeah, you. I, we give you our blessing, and you can call it Jiva Mukti Yoga. Then wow. she said, "Will you?" Okay, so they had just they had done one training, so they. She said, "Why don't you take this packet and do all of this from our training?" So I basically did like all the book reports and read the books and uh, filled out. Gave you some materials that they were using. Yeah, and I like did the application, and she gave me a chanting tape. That's how I memorized a lot of my chants, and you know the sequencing, and then. And she said, and why don't you come into New York and teach one class a week? And I got paid better at that time than I got paid. Sorry, Skylar. I know I, I'm pretty open about this. Then I, then Skylar Grant of Kula Yoga Project. Um, I'm still te- very good friends with Skylar. Mm-hmm. Paid me. So I got paid 60 bucks flat fee. Wow. And I took a train into New York and taught. And it was, yes, there was definitely a lot of dirty looks from the other girls there, from the other teachers. Sorry to call you girls teachers. They were like, what the fuck is this bitch doing coming in to teach? Yeah. That explains kind of a lot because yeah. you were this Jiva Mukti teacher, but mm-hmm. you certainly didn't seem to have gone through the same track as other folks. Exactly. And that's a pretty, I don't know, that's such an interesting, like right at the pivotal bridge of when things really were shifting with teacher training, you know? Like, yes. Like yeah. your, your, your teacher training was like, they came over, took your class and stayed over and you made them dinner, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was a culmination of many years of you studying with them. Yes. And a personal relationship. And, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, look, I think I will say this and I don't like to say this, but I think 
it goes against some of what I generally feel in life, but I think some people do have an innate talent for things. And I think much to my chagrin, cause that's never what I wanted to do. I'm a good yoga teacher, you know? So yeah. I, I was okay at it from a pretty early on, you know? Well, it's also interesting to me because there's that, there's the old thing, but then they also folded you in sort of yes. like, so they gave yes. you the materials and you jumped through a few of those hoops as well. Mm -hmm. So you could be yeah. official. Yes. Like that's right when that first happened and you could still get away with that. Exactly. Almost. <laughs> but then the rift happened, right? So then I was, that was at the old studio. Then I moved with them to the second studio, you know, the Lafayette studio. Okay. okay I remember that move. Yes. Yeah. And then this woman, Adrian, um, who was the manager who's still around, um, she, in my opinion, did not have a great bedside manner. And so I was teaching and this is how I remember it. Now, look, you know, Rashomon syndrome, whatever, it's all, everybody has a different memory. I remember, maybe it was mentioned to me before this point, I remember Adrian just approaching me in the hall and being like, you haven't given us the check yet. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And basically, I was meant to pay them now the money for the next training that was starting and officially take part in that training. Oh. And I was really shocked about it one didn't have the money and two I had actually already been thinking about pulling out not because of anything about not feeling happy there but it was just too much traveling back and forth and running my little studio you know so by that point you you had Hudson Valley yoga and you were just running in to teach a class a week Mm -hmm, exactly. From the very beginning, that's what I did. I would come in on the train, teach one class in New York, and then go back and do my little Tivoli studio, you know? And then after the move, they all of a sudden say, now you need to do the training and you have to pay for it? Yes. And mm. so, look, I get, in retrospect, I get it. Like, I, so I wrote a letter and was like, I did not expect this, you know, and they wrote a letter back, like, what are you talking about? Of course, how, you know, you're being basic. This is not the word it was used, but to make a longer story short, like, they thought of me as really insubordinate and rude. And I was deeply hurt and, like, uh, felt really like, shunned on some level by my own mother you know and but they did i will say to their credit they were like okay pay this amount they gave me a much cheaper amount they were like pay this and take the training here's a sliding scale i still turned it down which i think was if you are hearing this message then you're listening to the free version of j brown yoga talks to hear the rest of our conversation please subscribe to podcast premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium